All right. I want to just uh, welcome each one of you. Uh, if you're on, if you're joining right now, or if you're watching this at some other time, uh, this is a podcast that is kind of a first thing for us. Uh, we rolled out of last weekend's sermon realizing as much as we tried to convey and communicate as exhaustively as we possibly could in the time frame that we had, we realized that we were just scratching the surface. This past weekend, um, we're in a series called It's Complicated. If you're a 10 mission or you stream mission, um, we wanted to tackle the issues that are incredibly easy for Christians to fumble the ball on in understanding and incredibly easy to fumble the ball on in communicating. And so whatever the most controversial or offensive issues that are in the culture, we tried to take as many of those as we possibly could in this series and then just say, all right, what does God's word have to say about that? And how do we roll with that as, as Christians? How do we, how do we, what do we believe from God's word? And how do we flesh that out in a way that's that's explainable and understandable for the world around us, knowing that there may be a disconnect that some people will never completely get? Um, this past week's sermon was, does God care about my sexuality? And, and in it, we really attacked trying to help understand two key areas of human existence. And one is gender identity and the other is human sexuality. And so that covers the gamut of human sexuality. That covers the gamut of uh, gender identity as far as the trans conversation. Um, and just recognizing that this is not something that is a uh, those people issue or it's outside of the church walls issue. This is something that 100% of the people within our church not only have an obligation to understand what does God's word say? But on top of that, have an obligation to understand that this is an us issue. This is not an outside the, the walls of the church issue. Scripture speaks to these issues as if these are things that we have to grapple with in our own life and our own convictions, et cetera. And so um, that, that was something that just from the get-go we realized was important, but we realized on the outside of that that we just scratched the surface and there were more questions. It was so cool being able to talk to people um, after the services and be able to just engage on some questions. And we just, it was one of those things where um, our production team leads said, let's go ahead and put together an opportunity for us to answer some of the questions that people have and give people a chance to send in questions. And you have. And so I thank you so much. And so as we're going along, if you have additional questions that you want to uh, text in, um, go ahead and you can go ahead and do so. And we're going to do our best to, address those. And um, let me just go ahead and before we even start that, open in a word of prayer. That's actually something that we didn't do right before we went on that we should have done. So will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you are in control, that you are sovereign, that you're not only all powerful, but you're also all loving. And God, that, that gives us comfort as we tackle issues that are confusing or even divisive to know that you, God, are someone who cares enough to guide us and direct us through your word and that you'll never, ever leave us. God, I pray that you help our conversation today be one that um, is informative and helpful, and we'll give you thanks for all that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, I think it was Brene Brown that said, clear is caring. And so in this, I'm going to try to be as clear as I possibly can, understanding that I may even be misunderstood in that. But I also want to know, let you know that I know that this is not academic. This is not something that's just simply a theological or a doctrinal issue that seems remote or, you know, something that you can, uh, that seems sterile or, or that you can discuss without any emotion. This is real life. And so if I'm discussing something and it seems like I'm, I'm handling it in a curt or overly casual way or maybe even dismissive way, Please understand that is not my intent. My intent is to try to deal with these very real issues in as clear way as possible. And so first off, just starting off, um, we had a lot of questions that just related to sex in general, just the, the whole concept of the New Testament perspective on human sexuality. And that's something that I think is um, that we aim to address in the sermon. But God's creation of sex is first off God's creation. It's his concept. It's, it's not the enemies. It's not Satan's concept. People didn't develop it in the, you know, fifth century BC as just, this seems like a great way to have fun. This was God's concept and, and his intention for humanity, that this was something that humans would have an avenue to experience, um, but that it was very specific, that its experience was going to be in a very narrow path, that the narrow path that God devised and, and designed within scripture's education of, of this this subject is that it's between a husband and a wife, two people that have covenanted together and um, something that after someone has committed their life to somebody, 
I'm committing my whole life to you. The, the vows that we hear in a wedding ceremony, after I've committed my life to you, I then give you my body. That the design for sex is such that it's not simply or purely something for, you know, to attain an orgasm or something for me to enjoy, uh, you know, as a first person, this is my enjoyment. The purpose of this is I've got physical needs and that's why we do, we're doing this. The first intent of it is something that is beyond even procreation as something that is intended for a couple to have a process of renewing their vows. That if your vows are, I'm gonna give my life to you, the act of sex between a husband and wife is a perspective of I'm giving you my body. And that's where we get into a, a difficult situation just interpersonally and, and just as, as humanity. We look at that and we realize the pleasure component or even the emotional relational component of sex being awesome and exciting and wonderful. Therefore, I want to be able to experience that whenever I want to experience that. And when we take that outside of God's design, all of a sudden we're experiencing sex in a way that is, is out of the rhythm. Basically, instead of sex being something where I've already told this person, I'm giving you my life, I've covenanted you between God and everyone else that you are with me forever, then I give you my body. When we have sex outside of that, outside of that framework, what we're ended up saying is this, listen, I really like you. I don't know about our future, but I want your body now. I want from your body now what I'm not quite yet ready to, to give you with my life. I want from your body now what I'm not either willing or able or ready to give you with my life. And that all of a sudden causes fractures that are outside of the design and intent for God's purpose within sex. And so for a follower of Jesus, we look at that and say that sex before marriage um, is something that is out of place for us, not because it's dirty, wrong, or it's not fun. No, it's something that is intended to be something that follows the commitment of life that's given to somebody. And that, that's key. Um, once a person's married, um, Paul says, again, a guy who's getting zero sex, a guy who wished everyone was, was without sexual desires or passions like him, he said, listen, there is a narrow path for human sexuality and it's in the covenant of marriage. And once you're married, you should be having frequent sex. And that's, if you want to take a look at that, Go ahead and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. The first several verses of that is describing the framework of the frequency of sex for a married couple, for a Christian married couple, that they're doing so because Paul says not to do so is giving the enemy a foothold. And what he means by that is not necessarily, if you guys aren't having frequent sex, one of the two of you are going to have an affair. One of the two of you are going to fall into adultery. Now, that might be a byproduct of that, but I don't believe that's essentially what Paul is saying. What Paul is really getting at is this. If I am in sex saying, I am serving you, my purpose as a husband is to bring my wife pleasure. The purpose of the wife is to bring her husband pleasure. The two people that that is their outlook and their goal within marriage is to give, to serve the other person, to give them pleasure. That is a renewal of your vows every time you experience in that, of you laying down your life and literally now laying down your body for one another. And there's something enriching and, uh, and helpful within that. The, the intent behind that is that that renewal of the vows is something that gives a couple staying power that, that, that adds on to all the other relational components that increase a couple's health as far as relational health between each other. This is also one of the reasons why sex before marriage is so off. It's because when you start to engage physically with someone that you're not pledged to for the rest of your life, that design of sex works to keep you together. And sometimes you end up staying together with someone you shouldn't have. Someone you should have seen red flags with long ago, maybe your friends or your parents or people around you that love you said, what are you doing with this guy? What are you doing with this girl? But you're like, I, I have no idea why you're saying that. Can, can, can't you understand how amazing they are? And part of that is because the physical side of your relationship, the sexual side of your relationship is covering over and smoothing over red flags you should be seeing. And that's another key thing. The intent of sex is to keep you together for the long haul. To have that before marriage keeps you together with someone longer than you should have. So that, that just as an on from the onset is, is key. Now, some of the questions that um, received today um, are as follows. I'm going to get, jump on to the second question here. What do you say in response to the Bible's references to homosexuality that they're taken out of context? That, that's one of those things that's a really important thing. There's a lot of Christians today that say, listen, I want to do whatever God's word says, but I also 
believe that there's, number one, very few verses on homosexuality. Number two, the verses that are on homosexuality are more likely not describing a monogamous, loving relationship between two men or two women. And that in the ancient world, there just weren't examples of monogamous, loving, healthy relationships between same-sex couples. Now, there is so much academia ink wasted and spilled on that dis that dis disagreement between the two. There are people that showcase lots of scenarios in the ancient world where there, there were same-sex couples and it was a thing. So scripture speaking to it is speaking to that, which gives that prohibition for even today. But there's, there's a lot of other people that say, well, the, the references you see in the Bible are more about rape or um, some type of exploitation of children um, or in some way, shape or form, a coercive aspect of sexuality that within the Roman, Greco-Roman world, there was sex wasn't looked at as this loving relational thing. It was more hierarchical. And so the re biblical references are in reference to that. I don't see that in scripture. So we're going to, we're going to do real quick is we're going to take a look at some of those passages that, by the way, there's six of them. And this is also what's called um, by many the clobber passages. These are passages that are looked at as verses that Christians that see same-sex romantic relationships as not in line with scripture have used to clobber homosexuals versus that have even caused some Christians to be incredibly homophobic and super jerky to people around them that have same-sex attraction. These are the verses that Christians often bring up with Christian or non-Christian friends of theirs that are gay or lesbian, and in doing so, are speaking to them as if this person has not looked up these verses themselves. One of the things that's a thing, if you're someone that's come out of the closet as gay or lesbian, more often than not, you have looked at each one of these verses. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at them and just kind of see what they're having to say. First off, the, the first verse, and I'll, I'll just list them off, off for everyone so that you're able to get a sense of what they are. If you want to just write them down and look at them for yourselves, we're going to only be taking a look at a couple of these. But you have Genesis 19, 1 through 38. That's the account of Sodom and Gomorrah, um, Leviticus 18, 22, and 20, 13. Romans in the New Testament, chapter 1, verse 26, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 1 Timothy 1, 9, and Jude 7. Okay, so th there's a lot of debate um, about the Sodom and Gomorrah uh, account as that being specifically um, citing homosexual sin or, or homosexual relationships being off. First off, I, I think that there's some credence to that. Um, this is something where <laughs> it's not just that this is same-sex um, same sex sexuality that's being expressed, but in fact, coerced or raping um, sex. And so what's being called out of there may be a little bit muddy. Additionally, you have in the book of Ezekiel 16 verses 49 to 50, it says this. Now, this was the sin of Sodom. All right. So if anyone wants to know what's the sin of Sodom, now this is the sin of Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Therefore, I did away with them, as you have seen. And so Ezekiel points out the fact that, that the reality is um, Sodom's, one of their primary sins was the way that they were interacting with people. Sex wasn't even mentioned in the book of Ezekiel. Now, if you go down that list to Jude 7, sexual immorality is cited. And so it's, it's not just one dimensional, it's complicated. Um, Sodom and Gomorrah had a lot of issues, but the only issue that they had wasn't their sexual immorality. It was complicated, it was additional. You go down to Leviticus 18, and this is the one that I want to take a look at. If you look at Leviticus 18, it says this. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Leviticus 18 says this. Uh, 18.22. Do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. Now, as I was researching um, different um, organizations that say, look, we're Christian, but we do not believe that homosexuality is biblically addressed or sinful. They'll point out that this, the whole, the word detestable or abhorrent is a word that's used in other situations with temple um, problems, issues with, with within temple worship. And so they're citing that this possibly is relating to temple prostitution, something that God is calling them to step away from. It doesn't seem that way, especially since you have um, just a couple of chapters later, the same notion is reiterated. Um, and so what we have here is in the book of Leviticus, something that is called out pretty directly. 
as something that that God is that this is out of line within the human expression of romantic sexuality. Now, the, the interesting thing though is this, and this is a really good point from people that push back on that. They say, "Well, hold on a second. The Book of Leviticus is full of stuff that we don't do today. We're New Covenant people. Like, we, you know, we we are not. We we um, this is within this this." concept of purity laws that that Levitical priests were asked to do. So, I mean, obviously, you know, you had things in here that you've heard before, like tattoos, but you also have like, if you're wearing a Hanes 50-50, where it's cotton and polyester, you can't do that. That's in here. You've got a, a ton of laws that seem super arbitrary with regard to diet. You can't have bacon if you're living out this these passages. You can't have shellfish if you're living out these passages. And so clearly, how can we possibly even think that this is something that is for today or for God's people? That's a good question. And the question is then answered as you go through the Bible and you get into the new covenant believers. And so if you go to the book of Romans and you go to uh, Romans chapter one, it says this, just talking about God's wrath against humanity. It's, let's, we're gonna start in verse 21. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. So describing idolatry. I don't want God to be my God. I want him to be the director of my life. I want to kind of craft my own deity. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the, deg for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and they worshiped and served, God, um, they worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised, amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relation, sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Okay, so again, this is one of those clobber passages that if if you're someone that's same-sex attracted and you're attempting to follow Jesus, you've read this a billion times. If you've been if you're out of the closet, you've probably been quoted this at you a billion times. But one of the things that we see in this that's really really important for us is that there's something that God expresses as His perspective in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, that made its way into the New. That followers of God in the Old Testament are given an instruction that's maintained in the New. Now there's as we already noted, tons that are not shared. There's a, there's a ton of stuff from the Old Testament that we no longer, that this was a specific, this was a kind of a surgical strike of God saying, I want you to be different from the pagan world around you, do these things. And those things do not translate into the new covenant or into our modern following of Jesus. But oddly enough, maybe importantly enough, this one does. That this reality of, of how we look at our sexuality is important. And so this passage with, with regard to that is super, super important to understand God's perspective on the narrowness of, of human sexual expression being exclusively between a husband and a wife, not by a boyfriend and a girlfriend, and not by two people of the same gender, whether they're married or not, that it's narrow, that a person can experience a fulfilled life following God outside of human sexuality, that they could be a whole person outside of human sexuality. But that for those who pursue hu human sexuality and romantic sexuality, it's something that's found in the confines of marriage. Now, one of the, the, the pushbacks with that question as well is, is the whole idea of um, what about the word homosexual? Isn't it true that the first time we even have that in the Bible is 1946 in the new revised version of the Bible? And that is 100% true. In fact, the word con uh, homosexual or homosexuality isn't, it's like a, a late 19th century um, word. And so several people would say, man, our whole perspective on homosexuality has been warped and tweaked by utilizing this word that's not in the Greek, it's not in the Hebrew, and all of a sudden we, we have this, this off word. Now, that's, that's, a, that's a fair pushback until you realize that just because the fact that a word is then all of a sudden identified as the most helpful understanding of a word, doesn't mean that it's 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 an off word. First off, any translation that says homosexual versus the practice of homosexuality is misinterpreting those passages. These practices are not talking about a classification of person. They're talking about a classification of activity. Things that aren't God more important than God, lust, lying, gossip, etc. Paul packs these lists with things that are outside of the realm of God's intent for us and 
operating sexually outside of God's way is one of those things, including heterosexual sin. And so one of the things we've done, uh, we, we've done a garbagey job of is communicated almost, almost saying, listen, God's against sexual immorality, but truth be told, if you're a heterosexual, your heterosexual sin is much more uh, acceptable, understandable, maybe even holy than an, someone who is out of line within homosexual relationships, okay? All that to say, there's key throughout scripture that we see God's handiwork in communicating, look, this is gonna sound incredibly exclusive, but the expression of human sexuality is between a husband and a wife exclusively. Anything that falls out of that does not, is, is sin, number one. Number two, is not gonna lead to your fulfilling, the fulfilling life that God has for you in particular. And scripture has as a perspective on this. Um, I'm a big Wes Anderson movie fan. And one of the things that you see, I mean, if you just are watching something and, and it happens to be a Wes, Ander film, Wes Anderson film you haven't seen, you know it's Wes Anderson. The way that the, the, the shots are taken, the way that the, the dialogue happens from the script, the text that they use on the screen, the design, even the colors indicate there's this continuity from his, his body of work from the beginning to end. And the same can be said about God's word with its perspective on human sexuality. He doesn't diverge. It's very clearly that this is between a husband and a wife, that outside of that is calamity and sin and something that God has not intended for us. So it's our decision then, do we trust him on that or not? And that is just the reality that we see within scripture. All right, next question. This question says, what does the Bible say about masturbation? There are some people that wrote, um, what does the Bible say about um, <laughs> what is it? Uh, individual self-stimulation, which is the most clinical word I've e or clinical way I've ever heard masturbation described, self-stimulation, but that's basically what it is. So what does the Bible have to say about that? Well, again, because it's within a sexual component, because it's, it's operated by, from the fantasy of actual sex, we have to ask, go back to the definition of what does God's word say about the purpose of human sexuality? Again, back to what we said in the beginning, the purpose of human sexuality is for me to convey with the person that I've committed the rest of my life with, I've committed my life to my wife, to me to be able to serve her by bringing her pleasure. And for her to say, I am going to express to my husband who I've committed my life to, I'm going to serve him by bringing him pleasure. So how does masturbation fit into all of that? Um, first off, you have to recognize that the sole goal of masturbation is to get to an orgasm. Now, here's the interesting thing with, 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 with married sex and with people who've been sexual partners for a long time, orgasms are often, but not always, a part of that equation. There's, there are couples who one or both of the people have experienced sex in a way that, that is not something that always gets to the point of an orgasm. Within masturbation, though, that is always the point. The pleasure is always the point. But the interesting thing is that you're arriving at an orgasm not by, as a byproduct of serving the person that you've committed your life to. You're arriving at an orgasm by way of giving yourself pleasure. So the only person that you're serving in that equation is yourself, which does messed up stuff to your brain. All of a sudden, it's an act that God was intending you to have that was going to be um, selfless and serving the other person that ends up with this byproduct of joy and pleasure and passion, all of a sudden becomes something where you're just putting all of that intent and focus on yourself. And that's something that that is is absolutely, it, it messes up the wiring of your brain. Um, that's why it's one of those things that, that followers of Jesus forever have struggled with this. Cause it's like, well, man, isn't this like better? I mean, it's better than sleeping with my girlfriend. It's better than cheating on my wife. Why in the world? Like, I mean, isn't this like, it's a, it's a release. I mean, and, but the problem is, is that because of the fact that there's a dopamine hit, whenever you, you arrive at a climax or, or, or orgasm, all of a sudden, if you're serving yourself with that, you're programming your brain. You are practicing the reality that nobody knows you better than you. No one could bring pleasure better than you. And all of a sudden, any sexual experience you have going forward with your spouse or your future spouse, all of a sudden is tainted because they're, they don't know how to bring you pleasure as good as you do. Today will more than likely offend 100% of you. There will be very few people in here that will say, hmm, I can't relate to any of this. None of this ruffles my feathers. 
And I just want, I mean, someone told me this morning that they said that their feathers weren't ruffled when they were sitting through the sermon because they came to the service pre-ruffled. And so that's fair. But here's the thing. I just want to challenge you. I've got one word that I want to give you as something I want to extend to you in this sermon. And that's this. This is the word. Invitation. I'm inviting you to change your mind. There's going to be something that is said today that will challenge your perspective, your presupposition, or even what you want to believe. And I want to challenge you. I want to invite you to change your mind. And that might not happen today. You might walk out ticked. You might walk out ticked halfway through the sermon. That happens. But I want to invite you to walk out at least accepting the invitation to change your mind on this. All right. Well, thank you for sticking around. And um, <laughs> uh, what a weird place to pause. But we're going to go ahead and jump right back on in. So again, the, the reality is that that whenever you're engaging in anything that has a sexual component to it. You have to realize that you, as a follower of Jesus, we go right back to what's the purpose of sex and how does this play a part in that? And if the purpose of sex is me laying down my body for the person I've already laid down my life for in marriage, then it has to be engaging with that person. It's not something, it's not a, a, a solo sport. It's something that that you're operating with with regard to them. And here's the thing that happens when our brain um, starts to capitalize on the fact that I can experience something that was intended to relationally be giving to someone else. And I'm experiencing that just in isolation for my, for my own self. Um, the brain starts to get conditioned and practice something that I am all that I need, um, which is miserable. Um, single people are not intended to be all that they need. Single people are intended to be relational, but masturbation c conditions and practices the concept that I can bring myself the fulfillment that a relationship might be able to, or I can do something that is completely self-serving, which again, we weren't intended for, which brings in addiction, which all of a sudden your brain starts to get programmed that whenever you're bored, masturbation is the answer. Whenever you're lonely, masturbation is the answer. When you're sad, masturbation is the answer. When you're, when you're angry, again, over and over again, you have all of a sudden your brain starts just to carve these canals of as soon as you're experiencing something that's out of place or frustrating, you have a viable option to dopamine hit. You have a viable option to pleasure and, and escape that becomes addictive and causes you to become less of the human that God has crafted you to be and enslaved and broken down. You weren't intended for that. And so that's why that's an area where if that's one of your, your things you're wrestling with right now, know that Jesus has given you everything you need to be able to get through one more day of saying, I don't, that doesn't have to be my story. I don't need to program myself again today with this notion that I'm all that I need. I can actually deprogram program myself from that. Um, and I think that's the thing that's going to be the most freeing thing to you. Next question is actually similar here. Is it sinful for gay couples to masturbate for each other? What about straight couples? I honestly have to say, I've never been asked that question, um, specifically with, with the, the gay couples. But again, we go right back to what is the origin, intent, and avenue for expression of human sexuality. And for that, um, that if that's something that's between a husband and a wife exclusively, then romantic sexual activity, whether it's with someone that you're in love with or not, it is not something that's on the table. So it's not just, is it okay for gay couples to do that? Um, it's not okay for straight couples to do that who aren't married. And so the only avenue for sexual interaction is between a husband and a wife. And so for a husband and a wife, anything that is going to be you serving that person to bring them pleasure is okay, as long as it's not demeaning. If it's something that is absolutely disrespectful, pain riddled, or causing some type of... Um, uh, disrespect or demeaning behavior towards one or both of you, that's off the table. This is supposed to be something that is bringing pleasure, not causing pain or or discomfort or anything else like that. And so it, so that's something where you get as a couple, as a married couple, get a chance to discuss, is this something okay for us or not? All right. Big question. And this is a massive question. Is living together really all that bad before marriage? Now, here's the thing. If you're somebody that is a, a Christian and you're living together before marriage, you should know you are in the majority. 70% of those, oh, I'm getting a call from someone, but I'm not going to take it. 70% um, of those who are, uh, who ultimately get married, 70% of them are actually in their, hold on one second. I'm going to have to turn this off. I'm sorry. 
Seventy <laughs> percent of of people that get married start off by living together. And so here's the reasons. Let me just say, if you're currently living together or you're thinking about it or you're down the road, you're like, that's something that I'm going to ultimately um, be experiencing or have as like a prequel to marriage. Here's the reasons why it makes sense. Number one, nobody does anything of significance or makes a purchase of an item, of a product. No one purchases an a product or an item that's significant without at least 70 per 50 to 65% of Americans believe that is the best way as a prequel before you get married. That's the reasons to do it. But if you're a Christ follower, here's the reasons why you shouldn't. Um, and actually, I'm going to give you um, a reason that if you're a Christ follower, you shouldn't do that, um, as well as if you are an atheist. If you're an atheist, there's a reason why you shouldn't live together. And if you're a Christ follower, I'm going to obviously there's one that is for you. I'm going to start off with that. First off, a Christ follower challenges themselves with a New Testament sex ethic that looks at sex as sacred. And so again, um, because we look at sexuality as sacred, it's not just us anim being animalistic. Last week, we talked about that, that a lot of people think that I'm either an animal, I'm just, hey, there's just instinct and physical needs being met, or I'm an angel and sex is dirty and it's wrong, and neither one of these is a biblical perspective. But the reality is that that a lot of us, if you're going to get, if you're going to live together before you get married, this makes sense. But I'm telling you that that, that the sexual component specifically of that, the, even the whole notion of playing house sets you up for failure because following Jesus says, I want to look at this sex act, this very primal thing as sacred. It's special. It's unique. It's embodied with love and service and follows the definition of sex that we started out with. First off, that so for a Christian, it's it's offline and it's something that's out of place simply because of that. Um, again, if, if you're living together to try to see if this person's a good mate for for life, a good, a good future husband or wife, um, you, by living together and having sex, are seeing less red flags, even if you do see that they are someone that squishes the toothpaste from the middle. Even though you see those things, you, you have an, a le sometimes have a less opportunity to see things before you get married, okay? Number one. Number two, if you're an atheist, um, you, you may not believe the Bible or hold the Bible as, as uh, a, an instructional manual for you to live or, or understand God's perspective by. And so for you, you might be like, I don't need the Bible because I don't have the, this concept of your sexual immorality or morality or God, I don't believe in any of those things. My challenge to you would be the same. Um, take a look at, at statistics. Even though 70% of marriages start by living together, those who live together before marriage are 48% more likely to get a divorce. You have nearly 50% higher chance of breaking up and not going the distance if you live together first than if you don't. And so just from a statistical standpoint, you're not setting yourself up for success by living together before that. So is it, is it okay for a couple to do that? I would say most certainly for a Christian, you have a, a different standard of sexuality to operate by. But even if you're just using secular statistics, you realize that this is a bad move if you really love this person and want to go the distance with them. All right. The next question is, why do we need the government to give us a piece of paper that says you're married if I'm already committed to each other in our heart? Um, that's a great question. And honestly, the, the truth is, is that... Um, hey, if I love this person and I'm committed to them, I mean, we've verbally said we want to be with each other forever. So isn't it okay if we just do that and, you know, forego the whole concept of getting some, in, in our area, a piece of paper from Grundy County that says, okay, you guys are legal. Like who, I mean, wh where's the Bible verse on that? Where's the Bible verse that says you have to get some type of a government stamped deal on your, on your, on your wedding license? That's a good question. The truth is, there is no Bible verse that says you have to get a government stamped license that's official and legal in the state that you live in. It doesn't. But the, one of the things that is key and important is that a couple that is pledging their life together does so formally. There's something about the formality of this concept of covenant that we see in the Bible that is, it's like it's, C4 added explosive commitment that's different than any other commitment where it's just like, hey, we're good. When you buy something, when you buy a house, when you when you when you when you operate when you're operating um, in, in such a way that you're uh, you're making a big purchase, you sign something that says, "I am committing myself to make this to make good on this purchase. Uh, I make I'm, I'm committing myself to follow through with my obligation on this." 
there's something about human nature that we're just designed for covenant. We're, co- we're designed to live in something that says, I want to double down the fact that we're really together. And marriage is the biblical scriptural way of doing that, of saying, I want to say out loud before God and the people around me that I'm going the distance with this person. Now, there may come a day where churches are no longer, at least churches like Mission Bible Church, are no longer allowed to um, do legal state endorse um, weddings. Like for example, if, if, if the state said, listen, we're, we're, you can no longer, you're no, no longer licensed to officiate wedding ceremonies unless you officiate both heterosexual weddings and homosexual weddings. For us, if we want to be the cheerleader of people's success, we, we would say, I can't do a homosexual wedding. I, I, that would be setting themselves up for something that I see scripture saying for them not to do. So I can't, I can't get behind that. And in that situation, they might say, okay, well, you're no longer legal to do weddings. And that might prompt people to do this. If I want the tax benefit or if I want the legal benefit of being married, I'm going to go down to Grundy County and get that official license. I'm going to, I'm going to say the vows in front of the justice of a peace, and I'm going to be legally married there. But before that or after that, I may have set up an uh, appointment with Pastor Errol or one of the other pastors at Mission Bible Church to have a religious ceremony where we are committing before God this reality of marriage. Biblically speaking, that's I, I look at that as the key that I have officially come into covenant before God and man, and that's not just something that's flimsy. And so, is do you, what's the need for the government paper? I think it's a good thing. I think it's a, a benefit, but I don't believe that is the necessary piece. The marriage piece, the wedding piece, though, is. Uh, we had a question come through. It says, did you say living together before marriage is a sin? Yes. Yes. That That's um, what we started off with in the very, very beginning and as well. That 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 living together before marriage, it, that, that reality of engaging in that sexual act is something that's sinful. Now, there's couples that say, oh, well, we, we don't, we're not having sex. We're just sleeping in the same bed. Yeah, that's not setting yourself up for success. And, and you and I both know that's, Whatever your your incredible capacity to have a resistance to temptation, that ain't that ain't going to be happening long. Why would you set yourself up for for failure when you could set yourself up for success? Okay. Um, another question. Uh, you are still breaking up. Oh, no, that's not a question. It's a statement. You are still breaking up. Everything you have to say is very important. Well, thank you. And I'm sorry. We're going to get that. We're going to try to figure that out. Um, is it true that most cultures have some kind of formal wedding procedure? Most cultures do. Um, and, and, I, and I would say that the formality of it, the question is, is it formality that is religiously based or government based or both? Right now in America, we had the capacity to have both. If you have a, a wedding ceremony at Mission Bible Church, um, a pastor is officiating that, and right after the ceremony, they're signing the legal paperwork that's identifying that you officiated a wedding that is that is seen in the in Grundy County in the state of Illinois as legal. And so, the legal governmental side is the formal side, the religious side. That's that's the non-negotiable um, going forward. And there's some cultures where there isn't government um, there isn't governmental approval for two Christians getting married to each other, and so they they have religious they have religious ceremonies of a wedding rather than um, one that's endorsed by the government. So again, that's going to change time to time, culture to culture, but the marriage piece is key. All right, um, in First Corinthians five eleven to thirteen, Paul writes. Um, so if you've got your Bibles, you can turn there. I am writing, or I'll just read it. I'm writing you, writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, slanderer, a drunkard, or a swindler. Do not even eat with such people. What business is it of mine to judge those outside of the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside expel or kick out the wicked person from among you. So um, the, then the question follows up with that is this. Um, so if you are counseling a gay couple, men or women, and they admit that they're having sex together, they know the Bible says not to do so, and they tell you they're going to do it anyway. How do you think these verses above apply? Are you going to continue to welcome them to worship and fellowship with Mission Bible Church believers? 
And, and then the key note there is that verse 13 says that someone who's rebelliously remaining in sin is to be expelled from the fellowship. That's a really good point. Um, one of the things that I think is key in understanding how do we apply this is Paul starting off the whole thing by saying, I'm writing to you. He starts off, there's certain things that Paul says that are very specific with who he's writing to because of very specific issues that are taking place. Um, in this particular context of what's happening, you got a situation where there's a guy who is cited, uh, if you look at the beginning of 1 Corinthians, he's cited as having sex with either his mom or his stepmom. Let me just go ahead and go to it because it's, it's weird enough to talk about. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I love what Paul says too, with relation to it. He says this, uh, chapter 15, verse one. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. Oh, I'm sorry. Is this right? First, oh, not 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 5. Sorry. Right at the very beginning, it says, uh, it is actually reported that there's sexual immorality among you and that of a kind that even the pagans don't tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife and you are proud Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who has been doing this? For my part, even though I am not physically present, I'm with you in spirit. As one who's present with you in this way, I've already passed judgment on the name, uh, on, on those who's present with you. I'm sorry, I passed judgment in the name of the Lord, Jesus, on the one who has been doing this. And so he goes on from there. So you got a situation where a church is not only looking the other way at sexual sin, they're proud of it. Um, and this guy, again, so, some translations or some scholars will look at that and say, the reality is, <laughs> this is not this is not a stepmother. This is his actually mother. And others will say, this is actually not a stepmother. It's, it's, it's his mom. Either way, it's, it's something that is off. And, and, and what Paul is saying here is this, you guys have an obligation not to judge the world on the outside, but to judge the world on the inside and operate in such a way that's important. One of the things that I would say about this passage is understanding the size of church in Corinth. The size of church in Corinth, and this is why Paul is saying, I'm writing to you about this. I'm, I'm identifying a very specific issue you guys are having. The size of church is that you, you got 15 to 30 people at most in a gathering, okay? And so it's a very intimate environment. And in, in that intimate environment, you've got a guy who's sleeping with his mom and they're proud of it. They're looking the other way. Not only are they a bad witness to the world around them, but they're def in defiance of what God says the, the very narrow path of sexuality is for. It's between a committed husband and wife towards each other. And so with that, all that said, um, Paul is saying that you guys are looking the other way, not only looking the other way, you're proud of this when you should have kicked this guy out. How, the question is, how do we respond to that? Or how do we apply that passage today? And what I would say is this, because uh, Mission Bible Church, our church, this may be different in your church, and I would say different churches handle this differently. I would say that our church is not 15 to 30, um, but you know, on a weekend, we got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that are showing up. And so the ability to manage and, or even, you know, not, not, and this is going to sound um, derogatory, but, but be moral police over every single person that's showing up is impossible. But that is, it's true. It's impossible. The context of this is, is a more intimate gathering. And the way that we've tried to ad address issues of rebellious sin whether it's sexual or otherwise. I mean, as you can see in this passage, he's not only calling out sexual immorality. He's saying, I'm going to use the sexual immorality of this guy who's sleeping with his mom to talk about other issues. You guys have got people that are greedy. You got people that are, are operating in a way that is just selfish. You're, you got people that are taking things that are not God and making them more important than God. And, and they're rebelliously doing so. And so he's identifying that we should, you should have a very serious approach to handling issues, whether sexually immoral or others that are off. You shouldn't be proud of people that are disobeying God's word. You should be calling them out. One of the, the ways that we try to do that at our church is through membership. Membership is something, it's a group of people who are saying, we are not just attending this church. We're not simply in attendance, but one of the things that we are, are, leaning in on is trying to be a part, an intimate part of the church's direction and governance and decision-making. So members aren't just people that vote for the budget, but they're, they're people that, that are key parts of the church's direction. With someone that's a member, if they're, if, they're, if they're living together 
if they're being sexually immoral, they've been called out or they've been greedy, that they've been idolatrous. They're making their family way more important than their God. And they've been called out on this and they're rebellious. Then that passage is saying that you need to deal with that abruptly. What we've done in the past, it, w- w- there's one scenario where someone was living with their girlfriend and was proud of it, didn't see any th- problem with it. He w- was someone who was passionately following Jesus, but at the same time, he had no issue with this. And so that was one of those conversations that I had to have with this person saying, listen, this is out of place with your faith. And this is out of place with, with where we're trying to go as a church and you're a member. What I'm asking you to do is to reconcile this area of being out of place with your sexuality with with your girlfriend and living together and sleeping together, et cetera, and to do so immediately. And if you need help counseling with that, we'll help you. But what we want to do is is disciple you out of something that is going to be taking you off the path of God's desire for this relationship. This was like, it was super abrupt to him. And we said, listen, we're going to pause your, we're not kicking you out of the church. We're pausing your membership, your ability to be a part of that intimate group leading the church until this is resolved. Over some prayer and some thinking about it, this person made that decision to no longer live together, no longer um, being in a sexual relationship with each other. Oddly enough, they started seeing issues within their relationship and the relationship broke up. Um, the removal of the sexual component, let alone the living, to, living together piece, gave both of them the capacity to see problems and red flags with each other that they did not see before. And so that that's, again, that's part of the hope that as we're following Jesus and we were making these decisions, that we get a chance to actually see God playing that out for our benefit in the long run. And so that that's how we've handled that in the past. When we've had people that have been rebelliously um, in their in their usage of alcohol and and rebelliously, you know, basically like I've got no problem. This is not an issue for me to be drunk like this. And they were in volunteer leadership. We had to address that similarly. And so again, that that those are things that that are important to address. And it's it's never anything but awkward, except for that we want to be the cheerleaders of our church's success. And um, for those that are in membership that are under the, the, the next level of accountability, we want to be diligent on that. All right, uh, moving on. What about Deuteronomy 22.5, cross-dressing? Dun, dun, dun. I don't know if you thought that we were going to get to cross-dressing today, but we are. We got Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. Okay, so this is in the Old Testament. And 22.5 says this. A woman must not wear men's clothing, nor a man wear women's clothing. For the Lord your God detests anyone who does this. And so again, the question there is simply this. Um, Whenever you read anything in the Bible, I mean, I would say whenever you're reading something within the law of Deuteronomy, this is kind of the the constitution of the nation of Israel that's given them from uh, Moses and Mount Sinai. One thing you have to ask yourself is, okay, what is God communicating to the initial listeners, the initial hearers, initial readers of this. What does that tell us about God? And then what does that mean for me today? It's important to know that this is buried in a passage that's filled with other things, like we talked about with the passage in Leviticus, that are not applicable to this day. For example, I mean, um, just a couple of verses, handful of verses above it in chapter 21, verse 18, it says, if anyone has a stubborn and rebellious son who does not obey his father and mother and will not listen to them when they discipline him, the father and mother shall take hold of him and bring him to the elders at the gate of his town. They shall say to the elders, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He's a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the town are to stone him to death. You must purge the evil from among you. All Israel will hear of it and be afraid. So in that same passage that you've got that, you've got this intense command. A couple verses later, you have this bizarre command that if you see like a a bird's nest on the side of the road, you should put it back up in the tree. If if you see someone's cow wandering, you should bring it back to the owner. So it's, it's the very unique and instructional pieces for the people at this time. And so when you read something like this, you have to first understand the context of this is in the context of other things that are not applicable for us today um, as a command. But let's read that again. A woman must not wear men's clothing, nor a man wear women's clothing. The Lord your God detests anyone who does this. The important piece on that is to understand um, the idea of presenting oneself as something that they're not, right? And so um, there was a church in 
in Africa that was dealing with, should women be allowed to wear anything but dresses? Should women be allowed to, to wear trousers? Um, and Deuteronomy 22 verse 5 was the key verse that was used to say, women should not wear pants because it is detestable to the Lord. Now, what they're doing there is they're taking this ancient culture with this very specific direction, and they're applying it to what a cultural understanding of what women or men are allowed to wear within that culture, what would be seen as against the grain. And I, I look at that as a misapplication of that passage. Um, as you go through the rest of the scriptures, though, something that's consistent is this idea that if you're presenting yourself some, as something other than you are, and, and you're intending for others to read you as such, that that's off, that that's not something that's in line with, with what God's calling for his people is to be. And so I would say that, that this verse, even though it's in Deuteronomy, even though it's within the law, even though it's around stuff that we're not applying today, at least gives us an impression. Because again, that's the second question. What's, what, the first question is what was intended for the first audience? Well, we understand that's very specific to Israel in that first audience. But two, what does it tell us about God? What that tells us about God is that there's a desire to see us being able to not present as something other than ourselves. One of the things that we have an incredible problem, this is not even a trans issue. We have a very insecure culture and we have insecure psyches and egos where it's very difficult for us to be comfortable in our own skin. God's commands are never intended to harm us, but to help us. And so within this passage, we see the picture of what God's trying to do is trying to give us the capacity to be comfortable in our own skin and not to fall into, from what they were experiencing, what other pagan cultures were doing, which was basically going between the two in, in some way of presenting yourself as something other than how God's actually crafted you and created you. So that's that's the key thing there. But I would also just challenge uh, us to understand that the I, what does it mean to be masculine or feminine shifts over time, shifts over culture. And even today, if you get on a plane and go someplace, what you deem as masculine or feminine may be challenged by that particular culture and in no way, shape, or form sinful to them, um, simply because that's just how their outlook. What would make it sinful or not would be, are they presenting themselves as something other than who they actually are? And so... That's what I would say to that. How do you respond to a LGBT plus person who insists that you refer to them by their pronoun, their new pronouns? I assume you agree. Let's, uh, I think it's saying, uh, assuming that you agree uh, with the person's new name. Okay. Um, this falls into a category of discernment where I would say that you need to be doing some significant praying about how to handle this particular person and their particular situation. And I do not believe that every situation is a blanket black and white scenario. It's, it's like the series that we're in, it's complicated. And I think that that causes you to want to lead with love, okay? Here's what I mean by that. If someone is communicating to me, I love this person, they're a family member or a friend, and they say, um, they're communicating that they are identifying as a male, even though they were biologically born as a female or vice versa and that their new name is this, which is a more masculine name if they were biologically born female, and that they would prefer me to use their new pro pronouns um, of he, him, or, 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 or something other than that. I need to then go and do some praying. Because again, scientifically, I understand that the disconnect between brain and body is gender dysphoria. Because Gender dysphoria is something that takes place in the mind and is a conflict. And again, if you're someone that is trans, um, if you're someone that would say you have gender dysphoria, you know this is a conflict and you may have had this your whole life or as long as you can remember or from puberty on and, and it's awful. You would choose not to have the conflict between your brain and your body, um, but you want to sync these two up. And, and in wanting to sync these two up, the best thing you could do is to be identified as what your brain is firing at right now or, or has been throughout your life. Um, knowing that this is something that takes place in the brain, I think that we need to, to approach it with love and empathy. I believe that um, one of the things that, like, for example, if I was, um, I, as I shared on Sunday, I'm someone that within my brain, I was born with an inability to go without um, anxiety or panic attacks from time to time. And when I'm having a panic attack, what's happening in my brain is that it is firing on the fact that I am dying right now. I'm going to die. I have to escape. Now, scientifically, I am not dying in that moment. 
um, escape will neither help me or hurt me. I'm just, I am freaking out and it's taking place in my mind. Now, when I've shared that reality with people who don't know what a panic attack feels like, they say, well, just stop thinking those thoughts. You'll be better if you just stop thinking those thoughts, to which I want to say, um, it would be better if you would just shut your face. You know, just shut up. You're not helping me. You telling me to stop thinking what I'm thinking isn't helping me stop thinking those thoughts, especially with anxiety, for crying out loud. But the reality is, is that I have to grapple with the fact that what's happening in my brain is a disconnect from ultimate reality and truth right? Um, similar though, if, if, if you're trying to work with someone, if you, you're in a relationship with someone, you're in a family with someone who's saying that they have gender dysphoria or that they're trans and they want to be referred to in this new name or what have you, I want you to consider what would happen if you had a family member that, um, that all of a sudden was diagnosed with multiple personality disorder. And they wanted to let you know that, yeah, their name is, their name is Erica, but they're also Fred. And they're coming to Thanksgiving this week. And so you got an opportunity, you got an, a, a situation, not an opportunity, but a situation that you got to figure out what to do. If they come into the room presenting as Fred and you call them Erica, I mean, do you insist on Fred? Uh, do you, ha- no, no, you, 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 are, you are insist on Erica. You're like, you are not Fred, you are Erica. We're not going to call you anything but that at the table. That, I don't know. That may be something that may be the most situ- helpful situation, or it may be something where you you pause and say, I love somebody who has a conflict within their brain, and I have to figure out the best way to love them through this. And some, for some people, the best way to love them through this might be to call this person who's Erica, Fred in that moment, or to use pronouns that w- in the trans conversation that would, would align up. The other side of that, and, I, and I've talked with, with parents and friends of people that are trans that have made that decision. They've prayed about it. They're trying to lead with love. They're trying to be empathetic and truthful. And for them, the best thing that they can figure out to do is to say, I'm going to call this person what they prefer to be called right now out of love to preserve the long-term relationship and to try to have a future opportunity down the road that will be helpful to them. Other people that I love and have counseled with have said, I, I look at that differently. If I'm calling this person a he when they're actually a she, I'm lying. And it's not something, why, why would God want me to lie in that situation or pretend? Like, it just seems like the opposite of living a truthful and, you know, Christ following life to do that. Um, and for them, um, I would say that, that for you, you're, you're leading with love by doing this. If you're close to someone with like the example we used this past weekend, who has uh, body dysmorphia. In other words, they look in the mirror and they see someone who's significantly overweight. And yet by standing on the scale, they're significantly underweight and they're starving themselves to death. They're 67 pounds and, and this is not good for them. Um, they want, they, they see themselves as someone who's heavy. It may not be the best thing for you to encourage them to continue to diet. For you to continue to, 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 to tell them that, listen, yes, what you see is the truth and you should continue to pursue that path of getting yourself thinner because what you see in, what you are seeing is in fact the actual truth. I would look at that and say, that's not the most helpful path. And so for you, I would challenge you to simply um, recognize that this is complicated, that it requires prayer. It requires good counseling from people around you. And it may be a one-size-fits-all answer for your particular friend, family member, or loved one that you step into, okay? Um, next question. Uh, let's see here. Uh, we got some questions about how does this impact sports? I think that one of the things within the sport, I, I am the wrong person to talk about how anything impacts sports. I'm the most unathletic pastor in the Grundy County area, um, perhaps Illinois, but I, I think that one of the things that the non-churched world is seeing is that there is a difference between biological sex and psychological gender um, that you can't simply identify as a f- as a female and compete against biological females and for that to be fair for the same reason that you can't take um, you can't enhance your body with some type of drugs that would give you an unfair advantage um, that's and that's not even church based church led that's just culture saying that's not right. And I believe that that's going to be something that we're going to see um, a leveling out or a more common sense approach in the future. 
Um, we talked about, um, uh, let's see here. What about spouses withholding affection and sexual intimacy? It was brought up at church, but not addressed further. Um, that's what, what we kind of addressed right there at the very beginning. When we're in, just within the definition of sex, it's something that there is a very narrow avenue for it it's to be experienced between a husband and wife, someone who's given their life to each other, then are laying down their bodies for each other. I'm laying down my life for you. And then I'm laying down my bodies for you. And then Paul's instruction in 1 Corinthians 7 is to make that frequent and faithful. Um, and he's saying that, you know, not to be weird, but he said that that's what that marriage covenant is enhanced by that. The vows are renewed by that action and should be done frequently. Um, and whatever issues that you have, um, some couples, they get, they have a really bad example from their parents or people that they know where sex is weaponized. Um, and it's either something that one person is, this is my needs need to be met. I need to, you know, you need to be physically meeting my needs. And is again, he's not coming into sex in a serving posture, but instead as a give me, give me posture. And so abuse happens, which causes the other person not to want to have sex or to be pushing away from sex. Um, the best scenario you can have is two people that are committing to each other for life and making a frequent decision to lay down not only their lives, what they've already done in their covenant of marriage, but their bodies for one another. And so my encouragement to you is if you're someone that is resistant towards sex in the marriage relationship you're in to say, God, I, you know, help me, you know, heal me of some of the wounds that have caused this in me, this, um, this, this, aspect of me not having this desire. Um, man, as far as like, you know, there's some people that as far as their sex drive, they are like, you know, a triple A battery and other people are a diehard car battery. And I'm way more on the triple A maybe battery uh, versus my husband who, who's like a diehard battery. And I, that just feels awkward. This is a process for you to learn how to experience compromise and serving each other. And one of the amazing things that, that couples that are having healthy sex experience are that as much as I may not have been super pumped and excited about having sex with my spouse right now, after we began the process, the fact that my husband is aiming to serve me and bring me pleasure, and I'm aiming to bring him pleasure and serve him, that bit alone, with or without an orgasm, is something that gives uh, more of a euphoric, healthy approach to your relationship. Again, it's renewing those vows. And so I would, I would encourage you in that. Um, I was told by my father-in-law that I'm a much better athlete than I give myself credit for. That's not true, uh, but we're going to move on. All right. Um, we've already addressed Deuteronomy 25, 22, 5. Um, how can I support the LGBT plus community as a Christian politically? Um, how can we say we love them if we don't support policies that give them equal rights? Whoo, good question. So here's the thing. As a pluralistic society, um, I think that one of the things that Christians understand is that there are things that are legal that are not biblical. So for example, it's legal right now if if you are 27 years old and you're dating another 27-year-old, it's legal for you guys to have sex. It's actually legal for you guys to live together. Neither one of those is the biblical picture of sexuality, but it's legal. And so understand that in a pluralistic society, um, there are going to be things that are on the books legal that are not good. Now, here's a question. like If it came up on a ballot, um, should people be allowed to cohabitate if they're not married? I, as a Christian, I would say, well, I know what scripture says. And so I can say, I want to cheerlead for our society's best success. And so I'm going to vote. No, they should not cohabitate before they're married. Cause I mean, I want to cheerlead their best success, whether a Christian or, or a Buddhist or a Hindu or an, a Muslim, I want I want them to have the best life possible. And even if you're not a Christian, the best life possible is following the way that God's crafted us to live. Um, so if, if something came up on the ballot about same-sex marriage, I would say the same thing. Would I be shocked that society would vote, no, 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 it's okay for heterosexuals to cohabitate? No, I would not be shocked. Would I be shocked if society said it's okay for same-sex union to be a thing? Yeah, it, it, it happened. And, and so I'm not shocked. Um, but as a Christian, the way that I want to advocate for the good of my culture is to work within the parameters of the culture around me and try to serve them best. One of the 
best times for Christians and Jews in the Old Testament was when they were not in the majority, but they were operating as people that were blessing their culture around them, and sometimes counterintuitively. Um, the first century Roman world was totally okay with exposure, basically getting away with children that were born um, by ditching them um, so that uh, either throwing them off cliffs or letting them be ne near waterways or forests so that animals would, would maul them. And it was Christians that even though that was legal, interjected themselves into culture and was a blessing by, they were a blessing by, by adopting those kids. And so I, I guess the, the key thing is outside of voting, um, finding ways to be a blessing and a difference and a different perspective. I would say that um, because same-sex marriage is legal, you're going to have a gay neighbor um, at some point, a gay, a gay couple neighbor that you have an opportunity then to figure out how do I show them the love of God and um, the perspective of God without um, leading with, hey, have you read Romans 1? Because, hmm? but instead finding ways to, to love those um, who aren't living out what scripture says. Again, I, one of the, the greatest examples of Jesus, I think, is that um, Jesus was someone who consistently was around immoral people. The people who were least like Jesus, liked Jesus. And I think that's a Stanley quote. It's such a good quote. Um, they were drawn to him. People who were sexually immoral were drawn to him. People who were abused chemicals were drawn to him. The religious were repulsed by him, but the immoral were, were drawn to him. I, I would love for Christians to be that. Um, and so I, I think that it, when if someone said, are you in support of same-sex marriage? I would, and that's a political question. I would say, um, as someone who wants to cheerlead for society's best, or not even society's, I want to cheerlead for, for these two guys that I, I care about and I love because I want to cheerlead for their best success. I have to be honest with them. The fact that that's not something I'm in favor for because God shows us a different way. Can I explain that perfectly? No, but I could be honest with them, but I can also be honest with them that I love them and that each one of those two guys are incredibly important. I would want them to hear something that they might perceive as homophobic because of the po a policy that I'd be against, but that would be absolutely in conflict with everything else that they would experience from me because they would say, this guy's not homophobic. Have you seen how he loves us? That, that's what I hope that I want to live that out. And I, I want, I want love for our, our, um, our church to live that out as well. Uh, my family, this kind of leads into this. My family member is gay and is getting married. Should I go? I love him, but I don't want to show my approval for his sin. Um, and that is a really, really incredibly important question. I think that with that, um, you're, you're kind of like, how do I accept this person without affirming their behavior? That's one thing Pastor Eric used in his sermon, um, I believe this last week. And, um, but how, how can I accept them without affirming? Ask yourself this question, okay? Take it out of the, the homosexual component. And if you've got a friend, you've got two friends, they're Christians, um, and they're going to, they're not married but they're moving into an apartment together. Do you buy them a blender? If you buy them a blender, does it convey acceptance and approval of the fact that they're now living together? Um, if you have a cousin that is getting, that is getting married, he's a, your cousin's a Christian and, and is getting, getting married to a Jewish person, um, that, that is not a Christian, that, that does not accept Christ or receive Christ as the Messiah. Um, do you show up, do you attend that marriage? Because that is clearly something that we're not called to do. We're called not to marry someone that's outside of the faith. Um, these are, are situations that, again, fall into that category of wisdom and discernment where you need to be doing prayer and getting wise counsel around you saying, in this situation with this family member or with this friend, what's the best move? One, some of the best advice on that that I've ever heard was um, the, the question that came from uh, Christopher, you uh, given to Christopher Yuan. Christopher Yuan, as we talked about this last week, is a guy who has same sex attraction, has for as long as he can possibly remember. And in the midst of, of having same sex attraction, he's someone who has said, God has not called me to be heterosexual, hasn't called me to be uh, homosexual, he's calling me to be holy. And, and so the reality is, is that I, I need to be living that out. So the question is, okay, well, what about a gay wedding? What if you're invited to a gay wedding, Christopher? Do you go? And he said, that's uh, an issue of discernment. He said, you may not go because not going is, is a way to com communicate. I don't approve. I don't affirm your decision right here. But in doing so, Christopher said, you may be cutting off that relationship from any potential future interaction or influence. 
And one of the key things I would say is I don't believe that there's an, an easy or a, a right in every situation answer on that. One of the things Christopher said is you may be showing up to the wedding, um, but you may be bringing instead of a gift for the both of them to share, you may be giving, if this is like Tim and it's Eric, let's just say you're giving a gift to Tim separate from a gift for Eric, showing that, listen, I love both of you. I love you individually. I can't honor the combined reality of what you're, what you're doing today, but I want you to know that no matter what, I love you individually, both. I, I love the person that's my cousin. I also love the person that he's getting married to. I, and I can show that love without saying, I endorse what you're doing. I approve of what you're doing in that situation. Um, I think that's key. I, again, for Christians, the key move for us is to lead with love and grace and truth. John 1 talks about Jesus being all truth and all grace. And again, oftentimes we end up falling into being super soft and easy on everyone around us, including ourselves, by being big time on the grace side to the detriment of truth. And sometimes we end up being hardcore on the truth side to the detriment of grace. The gold standard for us in all of these situations is Jesus. There were other questions that were on a more specific basis um, that, that, and I actually, let me just deal with one more question for here. How do we, how would you address someone who asked you to address them with pronouns, they, them? Whew. I, I think that, that that's someone who's identifying as obviously they're, they're, they're saying I'm gender fluid. There are times that I feel masculine and there are times that I feel feminine. And the best way that I could describe that is that I'm neither male or female. Now, we understand that biologically, sex-wise, they are male or female, but psychologically right now, they're, they're a moving target. First off, you start with empathy. How incredibly difficult has, does that have to be for them every day to have that psychological disconnect between, where it's not landing in one or the other? That's incredibly painful. Incredi and so I, I lead with love. You start off with the love side and then you pray about what's the most helpful thing for this person. Is the most helpful thing for this person to affirm this gender fluidity, which adequately describes where they're psychologically at right now, even though it's in conflict with the more firm and stated um, um, reality of their, their, their gender sex or their biological sex, um, or is it to do the opposite? And so again, on that, I would say prayer, lead with love and ask yourself the question, what's going to be the most helpful and loving for that person long-term? Um, the reality of what, some of the questions that we didn't get a chance to get to today really skewed into you know, very personal questions of what happens if you're in a marriage with someone that is um, addicted to pornography? What happens if you're in a marriage with someone that has committed adultery? What happens um, if you're in a marriage um, where somebody, even though you're in a heterosexual marriage, surfaces as as gay? Each of these, um, again, are not a one answer, black and white, one size fits all solution. But each of them is something that the church needs to address well with the people. And and to be honest, I don't, we don't always do that great. I don't always do that great. But we need to be the type of people that are coming alongside couples, both both spouses, with counseling, with accountability. And with direction, I think that between small groups, celebrate recovery, counseling, and care, um, I've seen people walk through some really complicated issues where everything should have warranted a marriage exploding and and never coming back together. And I've seen restoration take place. And so, I'm I'm some, one of those people that sees um, even the most dire situations as having hope in them, and um, one that I want to see us invest in. Um, so again, what I want to close this with is this. Um, first off, if you're someone that have you just have no idea why we're even talking about this, I want to encourage you to go back to watch the previous sermon, um, which is, Does God Care About My Sexuality? And to really delve into that, where we've tried to go through scripture to find out an answer to that question. Um, but even with that, what we did today in the last almost hour and a half is try to address some really important, pertinent, and good questions. And the truth of the matter is, is that, um, that this may not have, have addressed all the questions that you have. And so if that's you, I want to encourage you to be someone that is reaching out to us, talking to one of us as pastors, calling the office to set up an appointment or 
even uh, texting in the questions or text those questions in, and we're going to do our best to get back to you and address those as best we possibly can. Um, that's that's something that's important to us. But I want to close with this. One of the, the the ways that we operate as followers of Jesus is following Jesus. As Christ followers, we follow Christ. He is the gold standard of dealing with a complicated situation well. And the gold standard in my mind is, is John 8, where you have Jesus, where the religious elite bring this woman caught in sexual sin in front of him and say, we know what the law says. We've read Deuteronomy. Uh, we know what the law says about what we're supposed to do with her. We're supposed to stone her to death. So what do you say? They're desperately wanting to know if this new rabbi on the scene is leaning conservative or liberal, or is he just like some weird centrist? And he disappoints them because he doesn't answer their question. Instead, he turns their question upon themselves and he asks them to consider the sin in their own life. One of the best first steps for us as followers of Jesus is before we are pronouncing judgment or even looking down on someone or even asking questions like, what the heck, why are you doing this? We ask the question, God, I need you to evaluate my heart. Give me the restored work of your, of your spirit so that I can not be talking to this person that's a, in a hypocritical way, but I can talk as a person who's been recently freed from issues that I've got. I could even surface with this person if I'm talking with them. Listen, I'm not perfect. You know that I'm not perfect. Here's some things that I've recently been struggling with that I just recently, even in thinking about talking to you, had to surrender to God. First off, we, we do that. Then the next thing Jesus does is he asks them, whoever has no sin to cast first stone, they walk away. He defends her. And then he turns to her and he gives her the assurance of his alliance with her by saying, woman, where are your accusers? One of the things that as a Christian we're called to do is not align with someone by saying, I'm endorsing your behavior. I'm defending your behavior, but I'm defending you. I don't love what you're doing, but I love you. And Jesus gives that communication to this woman caught in sexual sin. He doesn't make a public, to their frustration, he doesn't make a public declaration of where he lands on the sexual sin of adultery and its consequences. Instead, he defends the woman, he shows her that he's in alliance with her, and then he communicates to her, go and sin no more. Jesus is cheerleading for her ultimate success by letting her know that she's loved and the truth that her current behavior is something that's not going to lead to her flourishing. Jesus can do that, and he calls us to do that. We need to be the type of Christians that are leading with love, that we're, we have love and grace, and the capacity to show both to a world without any type of hate or bigotry. Whenever, when you, when you look at Matthew 5, you see Jesus saying things like, when he talks about lust, and he says, you've heard it said that you should not commit adultery, but I say, even if you have lust for a, uh, for a woman that you're not married to, that you're committing adultery. He levels up the understanding that God has for how that is so off. And so when we look at our own life, we just scour that. The other thing he says is, you've heard it said not to murder, but I tell you, if you have hate in your heart for someone else, that you're committing murder in your heart against them. So one of the things as Christians that we should never be known for are people that have a low view of sex. We look at it as sacred. It's amazing. Is it for everyone? No, it's not for everyone. But a person could live fulfilled and, and whole without it. They have dignity and worth. But if they are going to experience romantic sexuality, it's through a very narrow path that God has prescribed. And we can believe that because Jesus said that. And not only that, we can say, my obligation to the world around me is not hate or judgment. That, that I, I'm called to be honest without being judgmental. And that's something that we need to discipline ourselves with and step into bolder. And it's my prayer that that's something that each one of us steps into together. So I want to just thank you so much, uh, Mission Bible Church or anyone else that's tuned into this podcast. Again, we just tried to answer a couple of the questions that were pertinent that we didn't get to in a more fuller way this past weekend. This is just the beginning of a conversation I know for many of you. So don't let that conversation stop. Text in your questions, talk to us on the weekend. And yeah, let's look forward to the amazing opportunity of going through this life together. Thanks so much.